today I want to talk about how to become a good Buddhist and is Buddhism based on faith or is it based on intelligence or intellect or understanding and these are good questions for our children and the essence of Buddhism is the Eightfold Path that was the first sermon of Buddha and that actually is the path we have to take. So if we are following the Eightfold Path, then we are true Buddhist. Contrary to the popular belief, a good Buddhist is not the person who actually hangs around in temples and does a lot of customs and rituals. But it's a person who follows the Eightfold Path in his day-to-day -day life from morning till night and so it is important to understand what this Eightfold Path is. Eightfold Path has three components, wisdom, moral discipline and concentration. And under the wisdom we have right view, right intention, under discipline we have right speech, right action and right livelihood, under concentration we have right effort, right mindfulness and right concentration. So by understanding these, th these eight different things which forms the basis of Buddhism, we can become a good Buddhist and obtain good results of becoming a Buddhist for this life as well as for our sansara as well. So what is the right view? Right view is called Samaditi in Pali. Right view is actually having an understanding of the karma, that there's a reaction to everything we do. Every action has a resultant reaction. And we have to also have an understanding of ownership of action. And also that volition leads to action through body, speech and mind. So mind is the basis of all our actions. And therefore, uh, that is the most important part where we have to uh, we have to have wisdom so we don't we actually have the right view and we follow the right path and then there, there are ten basic unwholesome karma destroying life that is killing uh, other beings taking what's not given or stealing wrong conduct in regard to sense pleasures things like sexual misconduct, for example, and also uh, following a path where you're trying to please all your senses to the maximum. Then there's verbal action, which is false speech. False speech is uh, lying, basically. Slanderous speech is putting down people. Harsh speech is saying harsh words to hurt, which can hurt other people. Idle chatter is basically gossiping. Uh, about things which are not relevant to anybody's life. Covetousness, uh, ill will and wrong will are the other, other unwholesome karma. So if we are following a Buddhist path, we will probably not do any of these things in our life. And it comes not from remembering what not to do and what to do, it comes from finding the wisdom, the wisdom about life. And the wisdom comes from following the entire Eightfold Path. And uh, going further into the right wave, the unwholesome roots of actions are greed, aversion and, and delusion. So everything we do which is not good for becoming a good Buddhist or not good for our life is based on greed or aversion or anger or delusion. Delusion is uh, not having the correct wisdom, not knowing that is delusion. And all these things usually leads to suffering. The wholesome actions are actually based on the opposite of these. Non-greed, which can be also called renunciation, detachment or out of generosity um, and opposite of 
aversion is adosha or loving kindness or sympathy and wisdom is the opposite of delusion and as we follow the path we hope to understand the four noble truths which is the suffering the origin of suffering cessation of suffering and the way leading to the cessation of suffering the way leading to the cessation of suffering is the eightfold path we are discussing right now and so when you're following this you will get to understand what suffering actually is and these are called four noble truths everything in our life if you are born in fact the birth itself has a lot of suffering associated with it then aging is suffering which is a common agenda I hear from my patients every day since I'm a cosmetic surgeon everybody doesn't want wants to look younger and prettier but aging is part of our life you cannot prevent aging sickness is suffering as we get older or from other reasons we get sick all the time a lot of times we are sick because we are not eating the proper food sometimes we are sick because we are not behaving right or we are uh, taking alcohol or we are uh, not paying attention to our health getting exposed to environmental uh, issues like going into the cold or too hot areas or getting exposed to infections from other people mosquito bites and so on then death is suffering which is very obvious to most people nobody wants to die sorrow lamentation pain grief and despair are obvious reasons for suffering also association with somebody unpleasant is suffering if you have to go to place and hang around people and you don't really want to be around them that's suffering and somebody who you want to be with suddenly separates from you that is suffering and also not to get what one wants is suffering and <clears throat> so in Buddhism we say Panchaskandhi is suffering of five aggregates and clinging to them is what causes suffering what are these five aggregates five aggregates is what our body or what we are made of we have material form which is our body physical body then we have feelings and feelings come through our sense organs feelings and then we have perceptions we perceive certain things once you get the feeling we perceive them as certain things and then we create mental formations we think about it and we then either get attached to it or we might not like it or we may not have uh, anything any particular emotion about it and that creates the consciousness and all of them usually creates clinging clinging to more of the same and clinging to more of the same is pretty much is uh, what creates another life and so we call that panchaskandha a lot of people think panchaskandha means just our body it's not just the body body is just a part of it then we talk about right intention right intention comes as a second part of our eightfold path we have to have the intention to renunciate and not to be governed by our desires just because because we desire something we want something doesn't make it right so we have to understand that then intention of loving kindness is non aversion that is we also call metta then intention of compassion or maitri that is not to be harmful or be cruel to other people or other beings that is compassion and these three usually comes from understanding the four noble truths and the best way to develop all these things through is through wisdom the right speech right speech is very important not to lie and not to be involved putting down people or uh, having slanderous speech 
we had to always promote friendship and harmony sometimes even if you have um, sometimes these things come from wisdom if you are full of wisdom a person full of wisdom is not going to do anything or say anything to make somebody feel bad and also we had to abstain from harsh speech and idle chatter idle chatter may be something hard to do because sometimes people get so, so addicted to talking about useless things thinking that it's the thing to do just to pass time not realizing that that actually creates attachments to things you don't really want to be attached to or it it brings you uh, a waste it could be a very good way to waste your time which could be spent otherwise maybe following the eightfold path so and uh, so these things consist of the right speech we call it samavaja what is right action right action is you had a white killing animals a white stealing away from sexual misconduct and avoid lying we talked about that before but this is the right action through the body mostly so finally avoid taking alcohol and other mind altering drugs or products and sri lanka is the alcohol capital of the world they say and a lot of people are drinking alcohol some people think it's healthy to drink regardless of the health if you drink alcohol it alters your mind and with an altered mind there's no way we can follow the eightfold path because eightfold path has to be followed with wisdom and where there is alcohol or mind altering drugs we know that there's no wisdom there what is right livelihood right livelihood is the way we make a living to way to make a living without doing these kind of jobs where you have to deal with the flesh for example you have to sell meat or fish or eggs or even milk dealing in poisons dealing with weapons and arms arms means weapons uh, dealing in slave trade or prostitution dealing in intoxicants liquor and drugs if you are if you have a job which where you have to do with these things then it's very difficult for you to get into the right path and the right effort we always need effort to follow the eightfold path a great effort is needed especially initially while you are not having much of a wisdom once you have wisdom it may become effortless because wisdom will guide you through the right path so initially you need great effort to prevent unwholesome states from arising and not to react to objects with greed and aversion for example is very common when we see something we get attached to it we may like it too much we may hear something nice and we want to keep listening to that and that would be greed or to get angry about things that's aversion and you had abandoned arisen unwholesome states if you know that you are currently having thoughts which are not uh, which are not in line with the eightfold path for example you are angry about something or you want to harm somebody or to say something bad these arise in unwholesome states should be abandoned with effort initially while you are developing your wisdom you may need a whole lot of effort to abandon this because if you continue behaving bad in that manner then it brings it leads you to other things for example if you are angry and say something it might make somebody else angry and they might retaliate and then you get more angry that's just an example then you have to develop the undeveloped wholesome states and when you are developing wisdom this becomes easy you have to strengthen and cultivate existing wholesome states yet also understand that within yourself you may have 
followed the right path and in Buddhism we say that it's very difficult to get a human life is very rare so obviously we are born as Buddhist where the Buddhism prevails because we have done certain merits we have followed a certain amount of our path has been through the Eightfold Path otherwise we wouldn't be here so it's important to know that we are wholesome beings and so we have to cultivate we have to find out what we have good things within us and try to cultivate that then the right, right mindfulness we call it Samasati Samasati is basically um, the way you meditate we call it Vipassana meditation basically consists of being mindful of the body being mindful of the feeling being mindful of mental states and the mental phenomena and usually the meditation is best done through Anapanasati or breath meditation we call it to concentrate on your breathing because we all breathe is involuntary thing and it always relaxes us to concentrate on the breathing and that way we can stop our mind from chasing after other things and bring it to folk bring it into focus of our body feeling mental status and mental contents which allows us to study because our body is the library where we need to find body is the world basically within the body we have our world and by studying this world we can find what is the truth or the, what is the truth or we can get to the wisdom and going further mindful of breathing is the basic meditation you have Buddha himself to achieve Buddhahood and you have to be mindful of the entire body your postures mindful of bodily actions mindful of unattractive nature of the body you will realize your body changes from time to time and this change will bring yourself to understand the impermanence of things and also you will be mindful of the non-self nature of the body that although we cling to this body by developing wisdom we realize that this is a body we have rented for this life only and we leave it and go and it is not ours it doesn't belong to us and this these kind of things come through wisdom and when you follow the eightfold path it's not difficult to understand this and obtain these wisdoms you have to be mindful of feelings feelings arise with contact of six sense faculties such as eye ear nose tongue body and mind and there are pleasant feelings which creates greed and clinging there are unpleasant feelings which create hate fear and aversion both these feelings are not conducive for a good Buddhist then there are neutral feelings for and some some of the neutral feelings are not as good e either false sense of security gives you a false sense of security it gives you a sense of self sense of permanence that leads to delusion so when you are progressing further in the Eightfold Path there will come a time where you don't get any feelings whereas you see things as they are you hear things as they are and you find only the impermanence non-self nature and suffering attached to it by understanding these three features you can make further progress in your vipassana meditation and obtain wisdom then the mental stats stat, states mental states and is an analysis of your mind knowing that mind is only a sequence of momentary mental acts and the mind we think is real mind we think is ours or mine is actually not so and primarily we have an act of thought process thought process goes as a chitta there's a primary act 
it can serve feeling, perception, volition, and emotions. And all these things deludes us into thinking actually there is a mind which thinks so there is I, there's me, there's self and focusing on whether the mind is associated with greed, aversion, and delusion is the best way for an initial starting person to get about becoming mindful of the mental stats because that's what leads you to wisdom when you understand your inner greed and why do we think this way and why do we think and get attached or start clinging to things or have that delusion of permanence, delusion of self and that understanding I think is the deepest, deepest of all wisdoms we can get by following the Eightfold Path and as concentration deepens we get the insight and the insights come from understanding of impermanence, non-self, nature of things and the suffering associated with everything, the body. And as you progress, the mental stats, states actually disappear. You are not going to be thinking and a person who has gone to the ultimate length of wisdom the thinking stops, as thinking stops, delusion stops, greed stops, and the anger stops. And then we talk about the mental phenomena. Mental phenomena are the five hindrances, five aggregates, six inner and outer sense bases, and seven factors of enlightenment, and four noble truths. So as you progress through the vipassana, the final part is understanding these features of the mental phenomena and that final wisdom is what will bring the final liberation of the person. So what are the five hindrances? Hindrances are what stops us from understanding because the truth is within us and then there are things which stops us from understanding the truth because we are deluded with hindrances. So what are the hindrances? Hindrances are first of all sensual desire and if our life is entwined with sensual desires from morning till night absolutely no time will be spent to understand the reality as it is. If you are following to please your eyes, trying to watch movies maybe, go to see certain dramas, put the TV on, try to please your eyes, watch a comedy, then you are pleasing your eyes. Pleasing your ears would be listening to good music which you think is great and that is then taste. You want to go after good food, go to a nice restaurant. These are sensual desires. If sensual desires are overwhelmingly occupying your daily routine, then there will be huge hindrances which prevents you from understanding the truth as is. The second one is ill will. If you are filled with anger and you are always thinking of hurting or thinking ill will towards others, other beings, again you can understand how that takes you away from understanding the truth and these things also uh, sensual desire as well as ill will will continue to confirm the untruth which is the permanence you think there's something permanent you think there's a person here there's a self and you, you think there is especially when you are following the sensual desire you think or there is no suffering. Although you are getting only temporary fleeting happiness, not the bliss you can get from the wisdom, you mistake that for a happiness which you can pursue and achieve. And that is the one of the biggest delusions. Then there's dullness and drowsiness. That happens when you don't have any effort. You're not making an effort. You just want to live because you are born. You just want to pass the time. So you're drowsy or you're dull 
and you're not making any effort, you're not, not alive really, and that keeps you away from the truth. Again, we have restlessness and worry. Restlessness and worry both come from lack of understanding, lack of wisdom. When you don't have wisdom, you are striving to find something permanent. And when things change, you are restless. You want everything to be the same. When you are worried about things, similarly, you worry about one thing, it leads to another thing. Because usually the worries come from looking for permanence or going after sensual desires. And that worry will keep you from the truth. And finally, the doubt. When people have doubt, they don't think it is possible to be happy, to find the permanent liberation, which is nirvana, to get rid of all suffering. When you have doubt about this, you are actually doubting Buddhism as a whole. That doubt is what keeps us from finding the truth. And in Pali we call it Kama Chanda Vyapada, Tina Middha Uttachukukucha and Vichikicha. Um, I'm not an expert in Pali, I just remember from my Dhampasal days some of these words. It's not important to know that, what is important is to understand the concepts. So I encourage the young ones especially to try to understand Buddhism as a practical philosophy which you can follow in your day-to-day -day life. So what are the five aggregates? So we are made of Panchaskanda, we told you, and I have gone through this before, there's material form of the body, then there are feelings and we have perceptions, mental formations, and then we have con consciousness. We call it Panchaskanda. And when we understand what this pan Panchaskanda is, we understand that it is not real, and there's no self there, there's no permanence, and it's all full of suffering. And that's un the understanding which gets you to liberation. And we have six senses, and this very siddhanta, we have eyes, ears, nose, and a tongue, a body, and a mind. Through these senses, we perceive things. And there are factors of enlightenment. We get to understand this as we go through our Eightfold Path. Mindfulness, it's very good to be mindful. And that's why we don't waste time with unwholesome karma. For example, if you want to waste time uh, killing beings or stealing things with sexual misconduct, uh, stealing or taking alcohol, you are not mindful. And lack of mindfulness means it will keep you dwelling, dwelling in the wrong path. Then investigation. Investigation comes with meditation. With meditation we will investigate, like I mentioned earlier, our body, mind, men mental states and mental formations. And then as we understand, you get rupture. Rupture is a status where you do understand a certain tr things as true. Through that you get tranquility, just the opposite of Restlessness is tranquility and the peace. And that leads to concentration. So you get to concentrate more on your path and more on understanding the truth. And finally, equanimity is where your mind is at total peace. Where you're not going after raga or dvesha. You're not going after pleasing your senses. Or you're not going, getting angry about anything. Everything is accepted ik, with equanimity, and that is the basic understanding. But the deep understanding would be that when you have, when you perceive things, you're not going to think about those things. There's no thinking in a person who is arahat. There's no thinking, <coughs> and. Four Noble Truths are understood, understood easily as we progress. We understand that everything is suffering and we find out that origin of suffering is clinging and we know there is cessation of suffering and 
we know the way which is what we are talking about all this time the eightfold path is the way to cessation of suffering and and further things about Samma Samadhi uh, which is focused mind in the background of Eightfold Path to enable right mindfulness to develop insights to achieve wisdom and that is obtaining your Marga Pala so intense deliberate wholesome concentration to raise the mind to a more purified state as you progress you will intensify your deliberate wholesome concentration and your mind will become pure become you come to the place of equanimity and then with initial meditation you will um, realize that you have hindrances which may come while you are meditating and you will need to deal with that and then we know there are five mental factors which we need to become a good meditator meditation is pretty much the f important most important thing in Buddhism and Buddha says it's important for you to meditate for five minutes rather than do a lifetime of donating things or obtaining or observing seal because we do all that to obtain wisdom and the wisdom is obtained through meditation so when you are meditating there's initial application of the mind you sit down to meditate you're going to apply your mind we call it vitaka and that application strong application with effort good effort will counter the dullness and the drowsiness of the mind if you sit down to meditate and you go to sleep obviously there is no application with sustained application you get vikara or vitaka which are that counters the doubt the doubt in your mind starts to get relieved and when you're a beginner of the eightfold path you have a certain amount of doubt and that starts to go away rapture is piti is a joy of wisdom and there's happiness or sukha similar to somebody actually uh, these are examples the buddha has given the joy of a desert fair is seeing an oasis when you see an oasis while you're walking in the desert that initially you get a rapture or piti and that usually relieves the anger within you then when you get there and you're drinking that water then you get happiness that counters restless and less restlessness and the worry there's another hindrance we talked about which keeps us from the truth and finally your mind becomes one pointed in Pali we call it ekagata and that allows us to counter our sensual desires because we are sensual beings is the nature of us to follow senses and to be sensual and to follow sensual desires but with meditation you can relieve your mind of that then we talk about uh, dhyana dhyana are states or results of meditation initially you get sustained application rapture and happiness that's the first dhyana and the second dhyana is you are filled with rapture and happiness born of concentration then you dwell in equanimity and you get purity of the mind because of the equanimity and these are very easily achieved first stages then you go on to second stages of dhyana where you transcend into a place where there's infinite space you realize that the space is infinite and some of our scientists who knows the universe have some understanding is how infinite the space or the universe is and how finite we are then there's infinite consciousness we find out the consciousness is not a finite thing it's infinite and there's a base of nothingness base of nothingness is that everything we do understand as things of value is really nothing 
even self as they are just delusions and finally you get to place of perception and non-perception and to remember these are just states of meditation these are not these are not things you achieve which cannot be reversed things we achieve cannot be reversed are called margapala or wisdom so your defilements which we have can be latent manifest thoughts emotions volitions or transgressions Sila prevents transgression. Concentration prevents manifesting. But only wisdom prevents the latent defilements. And by obtaining the wisdom only, we actually have achieved real progress. So we do Dhamma and Pasana for the final liberation. Contemplate on the five aggregate, six senses. And contemplate on the impermanent suffering a non-self of the above means Panchaskanda, our body. Like I said earlier, there's no thinking with meditation. If you try to understand self with thinking, only leads to confusion because thinking is the process, just the opposite of eightfold path. When you're following the eightfold path through the proper meditation, we are trying not to think. We are trying to understand the truth. We know the breath of breathing is voluntary and it doesn't require an ego. And usually you don't need any control of your breath. And when you have a trained mind, that trained mind is very useful to you whereas your untrained mind is absolutely dangerous for you because it takes you away from the truth following paths which is not eightfold path but other paths into wasting time in sansara suffering through unforeseen un innumerable amounts of lifetimes without getting to the truth taking away from the truth and when the mind is still when there's no thinking then you get knowing and that's why you can't think into wisdom you can't read a book into wisdom. You can listen to somebody and have a conversation into wisdom. You can't have thinking and knowing at the same time. Usually the normal mind reacts to every situation. The vipassana or inside meditation has three signs, which is impermanence, unsatisfactoriness and non-self. Or you can call it impermanence, suffering and non-self. If a restlessness arises while you are meditating, it's best to observe it because it will pass away. Even that restlessness is impermanence. And by understanding that, you know, it's impermanent. If you get some kind of suffering or pain while you are meditating, if you focus on that, you realize it passes away too. That is impermanent as well. Finally, by understanding the impermanence, unsatisfactoriness or suffering or non-self, then that leads to wisdom. Seeing impermanence also means seeing non-self and unsatisfactoriness. So you can see these three signs are all intertwined. When you see some, when you get some wisdom, wisdom regarding one, you get some wisdom regarding the other two as well. Practicing loving kind is meritorious, but to be aware of impermanence or even for a second is more meritorious because it brings about insight. If we see an angry person, if we are a Buddhist, you probably want to tell him to do Maitri Bhavana, develop kind, loving kindness so he can get rid of his anger. But even if you do a lifetime of Maitri Bhavana, the anger will keep coming back as long as you have no wisdom. But if you've got wisdom about impermanence, even for a second, it's supposed to be more meritorious. Why? Because it brings about insight. Usually impermanence is not very clear to us because we try to avoid unpleasant and chase out pleasant. We try to make things permanent. We don't like to th the things to change. As impermanence becomes clearer, non-self and unsatisfactoriness also becomes clearer.
then there are 10 fetters and these are the fetters which keep us in sansara keep us away from the truth as we get rid of 10 fetters we get wisdom and as we progress through the eightfold path and we get to Magapala, we get rid of these fetters some all at once some little by little ultimately all of it personality view is that thinking of a self doubt then clinging to rules and rituals we cling to rules and rituals thinking that there is permanence so we all the rules come out of permanence you got to do it this way because this is the way it has been done traditions and forever so there's permanence there sensual desire aversion desire for immaterial existence this only happens to people who meditate because they see other immaterial existence without the body and they tend to believe that or oh, that is the way to find liberation we don't have body there's no sorry but that's not true that's just the desire for another kind of existence which eventually leads to suffering it may be a better life than material existence but still not the best best is to find the final wisdom then there's conceit conceit is one of the hardest thing to get rid of restlessness and ignorance and the mark pala so on we all want to strive for so on when you achieve enough wisdom by following the eightfold path we achieve so on as the first mark pala and it eliminates the first three of these fetters which is the sakai which you get cha and sila but the paramas which is personality view the self view of self goes away and the doubt goes away and you don't cling to the rules and rituals and you will tend to tend to understand that the things you used to follow as a child the things you learn from parents or children are not the right path the right path is what your wisdom tells you to follow and when you get to the second sakadagami you are going to attenuate roots of greed aversion and delusion you're still going to have some level of greed some level of aversion and delusion even when you're so on which gets better as you attain the second level sakadagami and finally anagami is just before arhat you're going to cut the sensual desire completely when you are anagami you are not going to be living as a gihi we call or you are not going to have life as a gihi being you are usually you usually don't have any sensual desires so you would probably be living in an ashram where you can pursue the rest of your eightfold path towards arahat where you eliminate the desire for immaterial existence conceit restlessness and ignorance even when you are so on you're going to have the desire for immaterial existence conceit restlessness ignorance even when you're anagami you're going to have this but only an arahat gets rid of ignorance immaterial existence or the desire for that and conceit and restlessness completely and after that you're not going to have any fetters and there you're liberated and you're not going to have another life you're not going to be born again and you have gotten rid of all the suffering and that is the end of my lecture on understanding buddhism to uh, get to where you don't have any fetters and obtain the final results of being a true buddhist